So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to Life Bite Season 2. Uh, just to let you know, I have started the recording for the session. Uh, we record all our Light Bite sessions and we pop them up uh, on the website uh, as part of the Light Bites History Channel and they also go up on the YouTube and our Study Hall channel. Um, so uh, that's why we're recording. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, welcome back to Light Bites. If this is your first time, um, welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you for giving up your Friday evening uh, or Friday morning, depending where in the world you are. Um, Light Bites is something that happens once a month, first Friday of every month. Uh, we just get together, we have a chat about all things light and lighting. Every week is a new topic uh, with new panelists. Um, and this week I am really excited to introduce uh, two of my colleagues uh, who have kindly taken time out of their day to join us. Um, both experts in color and control and light and just generally fabulous people. So it, I'm really, really thank you, Wendy and Nick, Wendy Lucky and Nick Gonsman um, joining us from America. Um, so hi, sure. thanks for joining us. Um, if you want to, if you'd like to, Nick, just say a quick hello, say who you are and, and what you do. Um, that'd be great. Uh, I am Nick Gunsman. I am the uh, product manager for EOS Family uh, at ETC. Um, I've been with ETC for about fifteen years. Um, I've been in the product management job now for uh, one year and two days. So that's kind of exciting. Um, previous to moving into controls product management, uh, I was a field project coordinator um, where I helped folks design uh, network infrastructures, control systems, um, and, and specialized in all things control. I also had a little side hustle uh, helping out with education videos. Um, so that's, that's me. Brilliant. Uh, Wendy, I'll come to you. I am the product technology specialist for color. Uh, I spend my time split between uh, marketing and education and the advanced research group. Uh, in the advanced research group, we do sort of blue sky thinking and uh, looking at technology and researching things that are not yet ready to go into a product. So not R&D proper, right? We sort of look at things ahead of that that hopefully will feed into R&D down the line. Uh, and then on the marketing side, um, much like Nick, I do training seminars um, and I help our internal marketing team. You know, I sort of do some training for them, help them when they're writing about something technical that's maybe not um, in their expertise. And that's me. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so this month or this week, this session, um, we're, we're talking about color. And I think it's it's a bit of a hot topic, really. Um, it's it has been for a while. I mean, I know when I got into lighting and I was doing design, color is the thing that just excited me so much. I just I love what color does. I love how it can change things, how you can manipulate responses, emotions, all that kind of thing. It's it, I love it for color for me is, is super exciting. And and it's been really fun watching I'm not going to say watching color grow up because that's not fair um, at all. But watching color evolve and 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 how it shifted from being a handful of filters, you know, dug out of a dirty basement somewhere um, into this amazing technology that we have available to us now with LED. Um, and I think it's fair to say watching LED grow up over over the the past few years has been has been super exciting and. I think we're in a position now where we have unprecedented flexibility in, in terms of our of our color choice and, and what we can do and the journeys we can take people on as a result um, of, of these choices. And, and I guess that's kind of where I sort of wanted to kick it off is um, looking at how how color has evolved for you. So so what your initial your early experiences with color were um, and and sort of you know how that's how that's evolved for you uh, not an e not a not an, not an easy question to get, to kick things off with um, but uh, yeah I, so, you know, I think I have a little bit of feedback uh, initially which is from a control side and I've I've always been a, a controls geek um, you know it it used to be that we just cared about 
whether a light was on or whether it was off or whether it was somewhere in between. And so obviously this whole shift in color, like you you dealt with color and design and during focus, right? And and so uh, the control side of color was really generally for moving lights. Um, and in uh, in sort of traditional theater, those were late to come into our world. Um, so uh, color has sort of been a, a newer process for us um, as we sort of look at the evolution of control. So, uh, you know, it's it's fun to to sort of think about like, we haven't had to care about color for a very long time. Um, and now we want to ensure that these really um, uh, rich and complicated tools are easy to access and understand. From a design perspective, uh, I guess I should say before I came to ETC, I was the um, product manager for color filters at Roscoe. Uh, and before that, I was a designer, theatrical designer mostly, um, some architecture, some other things, but uh, primarily live entertainment. And so I grew up using gel, right? Using color filter uh, on a halogen lamp um, or a dichroic on an HMI or something like that. And you knew, you sort of learned through feeling, right? It was a very organic thing. Um, and you'd sit with your swatch book and your flashlight, right? And look at what the colors and you sort of learned the, to, the translation between the swatch book and your flashlight and what you were actually gonna get out of the light, which is much brighter than your flashlight. Um, and all of this became sort of part of you as a designer and you had your favorite selection of gels that you always reached for. And I would reach for, you know, I had my usual suspects and then I would always try and pick a few new ones um, to try out. And, you know, color was sort of inherently part of the pre-production process. It was something that you thought about from the beginning, I would sit in design meetings and I would bring books. There's this, there's, there is, I think it's still there, the picture collection at the New York City Public Library, um, the Mid-Manhattan branch. Uh, and you would go physically to the library uh, and you would, you could, there were these folders of, of photographs organized by theme, um, carnival pictures, uh, sunsets, um, red, uh, <laughs> you could just pick, You'd just get a bunch of folders and you'd spread them out on a table and sift through them all and you could check them out like books. You could check out like, I don't know what the limit was. Maybe it was 20, something like that. And and you'd get your photo, your, your selections, check them out and take them to the design meeting and spread them out on the table. And all the you know, set designer would have done the same and costume designer would have done the same. And, and somebody else, you know, maybe you would bring books. Maybe there were, you know, a book of a particular painter that might speak to you and 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 color was part of the language from the very first design meeting. And and that seems to have really changed. Um, you know, that part of the design process partly was because color was more of a fixed uh, entity. You know, you put it in the light at focus and there it stayed. Obviously, if you you know, if you needed to make a change, you, you know, you go and change out a whole system of gel if you if you needed or wanted or in dance lighting for example in the booms those would change every act or whatever but this was a static decision um with the exception of moving lights that is, as nick said that's a dynamic thing right um but but this was a it was like picking paint you're not going to just wait till you get in the theater to pick the paint right and uh, or the costumes the fabric it's going to get sewn together and it is what it is um so it was all thought of sort of more, I don't know, more interwoven into the whole process. And then we entered this phase where LEDs came on the market and you could just pick whatever. You could just change it. Isn't this great? We could get in the theater and if the director had told you all along, this whole scene should be pink, it should absolutely be pink. And then you walk in the door and make it pink and they say, what were you thinking? I meant blue. You could just make it blue. And, uh, you know, or if, if something didn't look quite right with, you know, you could the paint or costumes or or whatever, you could just you, there was a thinking that you could just tweak it on site. So that sort of evolved into this place where waiting to pick color became a thing. Oh, just decide when you get there because your options were limitless. And then we started to realize what a horrible idea that was, right? Um, and stop me if I'm ranting too long. This is sort of like I was born in a small town, but. Um, but, you know, then 
then came the phase where you realize there you are in the hot seat as the designer, the director, everybody's waiting for you. The performers, the crew, everybody is waiting for you to now pick your color and make a great decision that you used to spend. You know, you used to like, I used to sit with my coffee and like contemplate my color choices and I would change them in and out and decide what nuance I wanted. And then no, no more. Now you gotta like pick something and go. And you could very easily use up all of your tech time picking color. <laughs> Oops. Um, and then we also, I think, started to figure out um, the pitfalls of LEDs and that color was somehow not the same anymore. Um, you could pick any color, but you couldn't actually pick any color in the same way. Like there's, you know, there's a lot of gels, right? And let's say there's, you know, you could pick from a hundred blues. Those blues are all very nearly the same color. They're all a deep blue, for example, but the nuance is in that curve, right? The spectral power distribution. If you on the slip sheets, there's like this little bitty graph that goes, boop, um, and that's the spectral power distribution. That is it's actually the, the spectral transmission on the gel. It's showing you uh, what light energy it's allowing to pass from your lamp. I'm sure we'll get into that in more detail later in the conversation. But but there's a difference in how you arrive at that blue. You, there's 50 different ways to arrive at the exact same chromaticity or overall color point. And that sort of began to be realized, if not scientifically or specifically or really academically, the effects of it were felt. The, the what's wrong, something's wrong. Why doesn't this look right? Why does this look different? Um, and so I feel like now, certainly ETC, but, it, but in the design community at large, we are all in this world of realizing that we need to understand more of the science to be able to understand and predict what we're gonna get and that there is a lot more that can go into that color decision-making process than ever had to before. Um, and I, it feels like the industry is moving back to a place where it becomes something that you're thinking about from the beginning. How are you gonna get to that color? Um, and there is still all this luxury of change that's available, but it's becoming more thoughtful. Um, and, and sometimes it doesn't matter. If I, I am the first to say, if all your lighting is the psych, just pick, pick your, just tap your color picker on whatever color you want and, and head home, you're done. Um, you know, but usually we're lighting environments full of colorful objects, right? We're lighting people, we're lighting skin, we're lighting costumes that somebody spent a lot of time and thought choosing fabrics for and making. And, you know, all the scenic designers work, all those paint colors, um, the director's vision for mood, all of these things come into play. And so I feel like we're now really in this world where for me, it's luxurious, obviously, because I'm a color specialist. So I love thinking about color all the time. Um, and I love noticing it in, in, in the world. Um, but I think as an industry, we are all realizing the, the gift and the work that is necessary to really make the most of, of this technology. I'm going to stop there. Okay. It made me think when you were talking about the booms and, you know, quickly being able to change a color. I remember as, as a student, so a couple of years ago now, um, we, you know, student student productions, you don't have a lot of budget. You're in universities. They don't have a lot of money. It's the same everywhere. Not that that hasn't changed, at least, you know, o over the years. But we, we used to like the dance season for the dance department. And it was the job of the first year dance students. They were not allowed to dance. They would sit next to the shin busters on stage with a pile of filters, which would pre-cut. And the dance master would sit there and go and color change two, three, four, five. And they would, and they would sit and they would rehearse. And so our, our lighting cues were actually the first year dance students <laughs> sitting and swapping bits of filters, which is fantastic. I mean, that, you know, and, and it's sad, I guess, that that's an experience that the current generation of first year dance students are just not going to have because I think sitting watching an LED fixture change color as lovely as it is for me probably won't have the same meaningful effect um, for them. So, and I think, you know, there's, and it's the same with everything with any technology that's shifted, we, we lose a little bit of something 
um, in in the process. But I think as much as we as we potentially lose, or as much as we feel we're losing, I think we're also gaining on on the other side. Um, and that's that's super exciting. And you, you touched on um, you know control and things. And I think and we've also spoken about language of color. And I feel that the language of light and the way we talk about it and the way we control it of us starting to, to merge towards a common point because, um, you know, we, we want to be able to say, oh, can that be a bit warmer? Um, or can that be a bit cooler? Or, oh, that, you know, I mean, I used to think of color when I, used, particularly blues, I used to have a range of blues that I would consider to be dry and a range of blues that I would consider to be wet which is not, I mean, you know, yeah, but I know what I mean. Like, like 197, Lee 197 for me is a dry blue. It feels dry, whereas a, a 119 is wet. I, I can't describe it's just, it's just, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just a word. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it's all of us finding that new language and finding that, that common ground, uh, you know, about how to talk about light. Um, and, and Nick, and I, I I wonder, um, Declan, does your dry and wet correspond to my crisp and muddy, maybe? Oh, interesting. Now, see, crisp and muddy for me would refer more to greens and ambers than they would to blues. Interesting. See, for me, so crisp is um, would have come from the, so you know, the ga uh, GAM filters, they're not very popular. I don't know, this is the UK. We can't it's afford a, them. <laughs> yeah, it's a smaller market there. So. So the GAM filters tend to have very little red content. They, they sort of cut off. So they're very, so they're colder in a way, but not in a, not in a harsh way or an inorganic way, more in a like, um, well, Chris, like a cold, like you can feel the briskness or the brightness it's brittle. in it, yeah. mm -hmm. um, as opposed to something that has, you know, sort of Lee um, or Roscoe colors, um, um, Chris James would be very similar to the Lee, um, uh, have more red. They let some, you know, there's, depending on the Lee, obviously, some of them do, some of them don't. But as a general rule, um, those filter lines had more warm, more longer wavelengths in them. And so they felt more earthy maybe and if you got them down on dimmer they would um they would go muddy you know they would they would sort of warm up to the point of, of really shifting their their flavor i'm using like every adjective i can that is so unscientific um but that was sort of one of my distinctions i wondered if that played into your uh wet versus dry i'm so curious about that but I think so what I'm observing now, and I, I think this is what's really exciting about this, right, is that um, these these we could have a, an hour and a half long discussion about an individual color and and yeah. try and our, our feels and our emotions and, and words that yes. bring character to this thing. Um, and all of that 90 minute discussion, as you were trying to communicate, has been wrapped up in Lee 201. And and right. exactly what Wendy said about like the spectral power distribution or or the the spectral permission that it allows the transmission, the yeah. Source, you know, yeah. like we were we were able to communicate these things. What what is really nice from a control standpoint about uh, a gel match um, or or a gel approximation um, is that you're communicating this 90 minute emotional discussion in like a couple of of letters and numbers of characters right? mm -hmm. yeah and i i think you know something that we've all nerded about uh late night at a bar um and and you know colleagues of ours as well and and uh, other folks with now the ability to finally tune that you know you have now an eight color mixing system with with series three um you know what what vernacular are we going to move to that says when i arrived to that super great spectral thing that that this yep. picture can do um by the way not mentioning that there are like ninety five thousand color systems now like how do we start to communicate that thing i i think it's i yeah. don't think no one has an answer but it's a i love diving into these things because you uh the shorthand has been so easy because it was a static thing you know yeah. this is what you got you want this thing mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah. yeah how do you it's translate sparkly blue into you know for an engineer if i walk in and say i need a light that is sparkly they look at you like okay i need radiant watts at a certain wavelength 
you're like, hmm, what wavelength is sparkly? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is fascinating. I think we, Declan, have we gone off topic, or should we just keep going? No, not at all. This, 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 this is great. I mean, there's there's no, you know, it, 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 let's go. Let's go where it takes us. Um, yeah. I and I remember doing a, a color session a, a couple of years ago, and I I um I had Richard Pilbrow as one of my guest speakers, and I and I get up and I do this whole long thing, and I mean Richard's a legend. He's you know I I, I would say he's he's the grandfather of of lighting certainly in the U, in the UK, and I get up and I do this whole long spiel about primary colors and how it works and the physics of light and this is how you choose color based on your content and spectral content and what it's going to reflect and all. And I go into this whole long thing. He gets up after he says, huh, I take my swatch book, I take the pin out and I drop it and I see what looks good together. And I was like, thanks, that's just undone an hour's worth <laughs> of, of the science. But, that, but that's exactly it, I think. And that, that's the beauty of colour. And that's why it's, I think that's why it's so exciting at the moment, because we used to have these fixed choices you know you, you had yes there might be a hundred blues but as to what that blue was going to do and present and reflect was fairly fairly reasonably consistent whereas yeah, now right. i can have a dark blue and i can say actually i've always wanted that dark blue but just a hint more green or with a little bit less red or what and i mean that is super exciting for me as a as a as a designer to get behind and go oh you know what can, what can i do to to give this a tweak well and i i think that you know the the reason that and we've already kind of touched on this but the reason there are so many gels brands and and individual uh components was uh there was a blue with a little less green there was a blue with a little bit more red um but those were static and and the other thing that designers often would would work with gel a specific gel is how they could change the character of that light with just intensity that was the only tool that they had to dynamically adjust what that that fixture was outputting um and i think where the exciting notions of all this uh, making our own color additively out of a fixture come um is not just being able to say i want a little less green in this light for the whole show it's I want to actually subtly shift the mood without shifting the context of the color, right? So, uh, and this, you know, like any of the uh, presentations you may have seen, any number of us do before on on metamorphism and and you know the idea that you can sort of hold a a color um, and and just adjust it slightly to shift the character of it, um, maybe perhaps even imperceptibly to an audience to shift how they feel in a moment is like i mean that's that's unlocking things that we haven't been able to do or have had a very narrow uh set of filters that would allow us to bring you know you think of your lavenders in particular that like have a lot of dynamic range based on the spectral warmer content that may be coming as the light dims through so um i i think that's where i've seen a lot of excitement is just like subtlety in a way that we haven't been able to do over the length of a, a performance yeah I I think for me the most exciting thing I, I don't know if any, you know anybody who's seen me talk obviously knows that a lot about color is exciting to me um, but 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 now I build spectrums you know um, I I know like I'm looking at the objects and what on stage do I want to bring out or push back what sort of feeling so. So I have really started to do that. And and one of the things that is, it was surprising to me. Now it's very common. Um, but, you know, when we use a reference, Lee Cho Wan, um, what that reference means to different people, let's take, or Lee 119, right? A really deep blue. Um, what that means to different people is is not the same. Um, it is, so there's also this like teasing out of what people actually mean. We hear, you know, with, with the, the gel picker feature in the console, you know, what color exactly are you looking for? Um, because they could be referring to their memory of it, which is not gonna be the same. They could be referring to 
the, you know, the rep sheets that were half burned. They could be referring to it at 80% or 50%, which is not the same. They could be referring to it on a 500 watt, B, what was that, a BTN? I don't know what the 500 watt Fresnel lamp versus, you know, a 575 HPL. That's a wildly different color um, versus on an HMI. If it's glass, you know, a piece of plastic would burn. That, that would have burned pretty quickly. But, you know, but, but all of those iterations are wildly different in their result. And we never had, I, I don't even, I was thinking about this. Um, as, as Nick was talking, actually, um, when we made the switch from, and we as an industry, uh, setting my ETC hat aside when I was a designer, right? And, and we in the industry made sort of the very gradual switch from um, EHGs, FELs, that sort of class of halogen lamp and, and fixture, um, that type of ellipsoidal, to the HPL and the source four. The HPL was like from another planet, you know, the, the quality of white, the light that came out of it, open white was a completely different color. Um, and so at least what I would start to do and what a lot of people I know, partly because of cost, it cost a lot more money to rent those at the time, but you would build your separate systems, right? So you'd have your systems that were using the sort of legacy style halogen lamps in the in those ellipsoidals, and then you had your system of of source fours and I would put those somewhere like doing a cross white thing or something so that you know somewhere where I wanted it to cut through punch through because it was colder um, but then over time in our minds I would venture to say that our memory of the gel on either of those lights is the same unless we actively think oh right I'm talking about Lee 119 on 500 watt for now or I'm talking about Lee 119 on an HPL. Or are you just thinking about 119, right? Because like they're not the same. <laughs> Forget what an LED is going to approximate. Um, again, so it's just it's just very interesting to me to, to sort of tease apart and then try and back out of that what spectral content people might be wanting. What is it that they're trying to get to? Declan, to your point of like a wet or a dry or cooler, warmer, these sort of esoteric, feely, you know, um, adjectives uh, is what I'm looking for, I think, to describe the different nuances and how we're getting to colors. How do we, how do we turn these smushy words? Some of them can be, can be directly translated to engineering. Cooler, warmer. Okay, let's follow the black body curve. Let's follow the Planckian locus from uh, warm white. Do, 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 do. Maybe the choice to be made is do we keep following the Planckian locus or black body curve, or do we follow it to a certain point and then move up to where daylight would be? Um, because those are actually, it, it, you do actually, the standards that, that apply to this do deviate. You weave the black body and go up. Uh, a little bit to be a little greener by the time that you arrive at a at a daylight color. Um, do we follow that? And that's your cooler warmer. That's very easy to specify from an engineering perspective. Follow this line. Great. Um, there are still 100 metamers to get to any one of those points, but at least you have sort of a direction to to hold to. Um, but you know, but sparkly. What does sparkly mean? Wet. What does wet mean? And for me to figure out what wet means, I would probably want to sit in a room with Declan and, you know, however many different colors of LEDs, I, you know, how discreet could I be? Forget eight. Can we go more? You know, how and, and sit there and sort of dial things in and try and find, um, you know, statistical patterns when he describes something as dry. OK, every time he says dry, there's less of this or more of that, you know, whatever, what are the patterns maybe, but then if I take that same pattern and show it to 50 other designers, I don't know, would they all say, oh yeah, that one's drier, mm -hmm. yep. Then I can put the button on EOS that says, this is the make it drier button, I guess. I don't know. I'd be a big fan of the make it drier button, just saying. <laughs> That's I, you know, 
you know, Declan, we have the power, the three of us, to actually do this statistical, this sort of experiment that I've just described. Um, we could we could do that. I guess we could it, it would be just, can we, can we have fun. a poll where we ask the panelists to pop in favorite adjectives to describe, <laughs> you know. Absolutely. So, uh, so after describe. five years of, of extensive field research, uh, lots of engineering time, uh, we'll see a, a yes. try button. Yes. <laughs> there'll be there'll be a melancholy button. I we will have one adjective <laughs> done and then we'll move on to the next five years of adjectives. Yes. <laughs> and in four hundred years we'll have a really great library. We'll have a really great suite of designer feely buttons, yeah. So, yeah. You actually raised an interesting point, and that actually brings me back to one of the questions that Charles has, has popped in. And the question is, what's the best color choice for a melancholic mood lighting on stage? And, and I think this is the fantastic thing about lighting and color, is th there are no rules. Any I mean, for me, need. absolutely. I, I might say, well, it needs to be, you know, pale, steely blues and a but it could equally be, you can be just as melancholic in the warm world, in, in, in the sort of amber world, if you, if you pick your colors and your mood. And, you know, a, a single, it, it, maybe it's just a single light. It doesn't even have to be any color, a single source in, and I'll say open white, because of course that's a variable term these days too. But yeah. so it's, uh, it's, it's such a hard thing to, to quantify. And, and the other question that's there is, you know, are we going to continue to use swatch books? to discuss which blue we want, yeah, probably not, because it's just that. It's we, I think, as, as designers and programmers, are going to end up with our own library of color that we will just take, we'll have like a suitcase. So we're going to, so instead of, in, in my, you know, my bag of tricks, I used to have my swatch book or books. I'm now going to have a memory stick with my colors in, and I'm going to load those into the console, and there we go. And, you know, we'll be in tech, and I'll say, great, so please can we have a happy jolly blue? for the scene or yeah. melancholic pink unlikely but you know we'll give it a go um and 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 i think that's what it's going to be i think it, it would be near on impossible to standardize it and, and actually part of me hopes that we never find a standard for it because it's just too exciting uh, as it is at the moment that yeah, yeah. it's you know it, it, this is probably also the moment to say it's all relative so to keep in mind that your palette is you can make anything look like it's white, right? Our brains are manipulatable. Um, so so as you to your point, Declan, anything could be made to look melancholic depending on what's around it, right? It just depends on what the rest of the of the picture is. Um, setting aside all the other aspects, obviously, you know, angle, shadow, all the sort of form things that come into play in intensity, setting all those aside just focusing on the color aspect, it's all relative. You can, you know, the easy, the easiest example is lavender can be made to look cool or warm. It can be made to look like sunlight or moonlight, right? That's a very easy example. Um, but that is true of, you know, any of like a blue, you can make a blue look very, very warm or very, very cold or very, very wet or very, very dry or very sparkly or dull. Um, just depending on what's around it, you know, will it, it'll be the one melancholy light because all the others around it are happier. I think um, maybe an example, Tom Littrell had a cue set that he would use. Nick knows where I'm going with this, right? And, and we use it often in demonstrations. We show you, you know, a blue that's full of life. that's very vibrant. It has a lot of red content. Um, and you can hold the same color point and pull that red out and you look like death. Right. So if you imagine a stage wash all in this same blue and just in the one that's focused on the sad performer, you could pull the red just out of that one. And that one performer would look very sad. Right. Or like something was was wrong. Um, and that sort of wonderful control. Um, you know, and then whatever it is that this person needs to spark joy for the rest of the play to continue, that thing comes in some spotlight somewhere else, and then the red comes back in, and you know, all of these things are possible, and it just depends on what the whole, or it is, it is impacted by what's around it. Well, I, I think going back to sort of like Declan's, you know, those are the sorts of things that the the suitcase, right? Those are the tricks that we can we can bring with us, and I think from a programmer's perspective. Um, you know, certainly from from ES development side, right? We we give you tools like color palettes and presets and things to compose those things and to easily bring them 
show to show to show. Um, so I, I think that that's already happening, right? Like people, designers, uh, it, we saw with programmers first where they were traveling with with colors and, and other tricks, right? Um, uh, but but designers are starting to travel with with their little suitcase um, and pull up on a, a show and say to the, the programmer, you know, hey, merge these in. Here's the stuff that I like to use. Um, and, and those can be starting points, but I, you know, the, the idea that this is all part of a composition, I think is what's really important. Um, and that you don't have to hang a second light now to do that, that effect, right? You just nudge it a little, you do the little cool, the, uh, Wendy calls our tint tools, the uppy downy buttons, which I always love. Um, and you just do the downy on, you know, the cooler, um, and you're there. So, yeah, I, I think it. I'm interested to see how that evolves. And I think Lee had just asked a question as well about, you know, I think one of the things that is missing, and I, I like Declan's like, I don't really want it to like settle in, but but what that misses is, um, again, short form communication when you need to take that thing that you feel in a specific space in a specific composition um, and, and articulate that to uh, a team. Um, uh, if you need to document a show, um, you know, that becomes really difficult, right? Lots of shows do documentation um, for historic purposes. So um, I don't know. I don't know where we'll end up language. It's, it's tricky. I mean, Lee, Lee's question for any, any, of the, um, any, any of the audience who perhaps can't see it is, how do you show your happy blue in a creative meeting? Um, I, I think the swatch book is like Wendy's sort of picture book at the time. So you have, you have a reference point. Um, but it's hard to go into a meeting with a set of uh, with a set of adjectives because uh, yeah everyone's going to interpret that difference and and it is it's it's how do we how, how do we show color because it used to be as when you touched on it, ahead of tech everyone would have a reasonable idea of what the color palette was going to be because you know you you you'd, you'd show people swatch books or whatever it was in the meeting and uh, yeah and I still maintain that everyone in the world has two jobs their own and lighting so you know everyone likes to think they 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 know you know so you can show a director a swatch book and they go ah, i know exactly what that blue's gonna do and you think yeah okay we'll see <laughs> we'll see but at least there was a starting point and i think that um i won't say it's been taken away from us but it's it's morphed into into something new and i think we're all trying to find out how how to communicate color it's always been easy for, for scenic people. You know, if, if I go into a production meeting and I say, I'm going to paint the wall sky blue, you've got a pretty good idea in your mind of what that wall's going to look like. If I say to you, oh, there'll be a sky blue wash of light on stage, most people's eyes glaze over. They, 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 they can't, it, it's a much harder thing to, to, to quantify and to, and to it's, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's not a tangible thing anymore. Um, and I guess the, 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 sick, the trick for us is to find a way of making it more tangible without losing the... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've run out of adjectives. I mean, I, think, used them. You know, I, guess, I feel like for designers, then, you know, maybe, maybe there's more, maybe you have to do more renderings, right? Maybe there's more, um, more of that that happens. But I think the problem is, the problem comes in then in, in or one of the challenges is translating the picture in your mind of what the stage should look like. Then when you go in, if your LED fixtures are not set to deliver that, you know, if something is, is amiss, usually that's because of the spectral power distribution, how, you know, which LEDs are in the fixture, what wavelengths are they emitting, are they feeding the clothes the way you need them to? Are they, you know, are they rendering all the stuff on stage the way that you intended? And if they are not, um, are you able, do you have the skill set and the tools available to make the right, to make the necessary adjustments to get it where you need it to go? You know, are we at a place where, um, and, and this is real, I guess this is a question. Um, are we at a place where the designers are comfortable looking at something and saying, okay, you know, looking at the composition on stage and understanding if it's an overall color change that they want or if it is a spectral change, if they're trying to change something in the in the distribution of the radiant energy, you know, are they, are they, 
is there too much green and they need to pull back? And if the green doesn't do it, maybe it's the lime or the cyan that they need to sort of tweak, or is it really that they don't need less green, they need more amber? Or, you know, is there, is that skills, how can we develop that skill set, I guess? Um, how do we, now as a manufacturer, how do we help, how do we enable the designers to really understand the, and, con and take control of, take ownership of that power, that control, you know, to be able to make those adjustments? Well, and we talk about from a control side too, you know, it's, it, uh, what, with this ability now to sort of pick any color you want and every nuance of every color that you want in like, um, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's, it's so a much. lot, and and we we certainly have discussions. And when you and I have talked about this yep. at length, of like, how can we, you know, where do we start to do software development? So when your programmer is sitting at the console, it gives you um, a, a set of things that you can audition, right? That you can just quickly, you know, uh, I, I think of sort of like my my Amazon shopping cart is like those people who like this power spectral distribution also like these <laughs> ones. You know, yeah. and and like, oh, well, I want to like audition those things because all of this, you know, again, we could sit and we could talk for 90 minutes about a single color. All of this is happening in a room full of people that are waiting for you to make a choice. That are waiting. Um, yeah. So so there is a timeliness to all of this that, you know, we we are always looking for future ideas of putting things in front of you. Um, that will be relevant to what you're doing so that you can quickly say, give me one, give me two, give me three, no, give me two again, four, no, go back to two and and move on. Um, you know, I, I and think how many decisions can we anticipate for you so you don't have to make them, right? Yeah, yeah. So um I think that's an exciting color control frontier is is giving yeah. you curated choice in those moments, right? To say, all right, how do we provide a, a quick and easy thing? Um for you to to make those quick decisions, um, yeah. you know, like, does it need, maybe the designer doesn't need to think, doesn't need more amber or less lime or whatever, but we can present things that have some of those in there once we know what wet and dry mean, and we can put those into this, you know, like, it's, it's a lot. So, but, it's, you know, the other thing, oh, I'm sorry, Declan, the other thing that I sort mm -hmm. of think about with all of this, just from a designer needing technical knowledge, um, you know, we're we're also all talking about this sort of in the context of maybe a single fixture, a single color system. Um, so I've somehow somehow I've created a language that I can communicate pre, you know, in production meetings with my artistic staff. Um, and then I've brought that color in and I'm using it on my luster and it is absolutely the color that I want with the right amount of limes and the right amount of ambers and everything's good. And then it's like, oh, well, we're going to move that uh, upstage two meters. And now I have to move that job to the fixture that's on stage, which is my color source, which is mm -hmm. a completely different thing. And then they they move it left, you know, three meters. And now I'm using my upstage upstage rig, which are my RGBA. You know, we bought them 10 years ago. They've recycled their way further and further upstage. Uh, you know, like, so even trying to do, once you've come to all of those decisions, uh, mm -hmm. and now I have to move color systems. The designer has to understand, I think, more and more what the scientific or, or the technical capabilities of different color systems are. Um, and and one of the things we talk about a lot on our development side is like there's only so much that a a console can do. You know, if you if you have four colors of narrow band emitters versus eight colors of narrow band emitters, um, the console can't force more spectrum out of a fixture that it doesn't have. So the design team has to uh, be aware of how to morph that into a new color system that accomplishes the same job that they were hoping to do on a different color system. We've, we've kind of inverted the way we deal with color, really, because we used to start with, I'll say, full spectrum light source. I know that's not true because, you know, the, the peaks and troughs. But whether it was daylight or a tungsten source, you pretty much started with everything and you were taking stuff away. Whereas now, although when you turn the fixture on by default, it, you know, everything comes on, but technically you're starting with nothing and, and you're choosing which bits, you know, to, to add in. And you know, we, you know, we, we all did RGB 
colour theory in school and science class and we all sort of understand that and it's been in our televisions and our monitors and our everything for you know a few years we, we like to think we've got a handle on that but one extra little color creeps in there and the whole game changes and it's 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 it, i i find that it's you know I, i've always the thing, one of the things i've loved about lighting is the fact that it's that awesome fusion between science and art you have to understand the science but you've got to get the art and you know it's it's finding this and it feels at the moment that there's been a little bit of a shift um not intentionally I, I, you know that's just the way things are but it feels like now you have to have a little bit more of the science to be able to 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 get to the art and and i i wonder if sometimes that's that's just too intimidating and people go do you know what i just i'm just going to push that button and and that'll have to do and, and it's 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 a really tricky thing i think so but i also think that it's a transitional time i hope i think it feels to me like you know there are designers now who grew up on leds right that this is not new for them this is this is the technology that has always been there and so i feel like it's going to become owned in the same way eventually you know i feel like we're in a time where there are those of us that grew up on gels and it's you know change is hard and there's a lot of this science that is just it's hard and if you don't if it doesn't grab you as a curiosity, if you are not like, oh, I really want to go down this rabbit hole, it can be really intimidating. Um, you know, I think there's also people, you know, we came in to LEDs when they were terrible. <laughs> you know, like RGB fixtures, they're just terrible. Um, they're just sad. Um, and uh, I mean, they're great for some things. Again, you're just lighting a psych or like columns at a party. You knock yourself out. Like, that's awesome. Go, go do it. It's awesome. Um, but but what we can do now is so much more sophisticated but and i feel like it is i think it will be as intuitive eventually i think it will be i think that it's just still new you know color filters as a disposable medium you know those have been around for i don't know 100 years um in some effect in some ways more than that, I did a I did a thing a report in college. It was a very long time ago about using color filters. You know, like in Shakespearean times. I don't remember exactly when it was, and I'm going to get all these details wrong, and everybody on YouTube is going to tell me how I don't remember my history. But, um, but uh, you know, they would essentially use like put some colored water in front of a candle, and poof, you have a color filter. So. The idea of taking away wavelengths has been around for a very long time. Choosing to put what you put in is different and has only been around for 10 years, a little more, 15, um, maybe 20, I don't know. Uh, but really in the marketplace, not that long. And And I think when we see... I don't know, fast forward, maybe it's 10 years from now. Um, maybe it's only five years from now, but sometime in the very foreseeable future, I, I really feel like we're gonna find that that designers listening to this conversation are gonna think we're a bunch of old coots and they know, you know, and, and they're like, of course, all I have to do is is tweak the, the levels for the emitters and I'm good to go. Like, what is all this, you know? <laughs> What's all this about? Like, I really think that it's going to be. My my university experience was, you know, I I remember that how my color memory developed and how I sort of got that intuitive sense with gel was spending time with it. You know, yeah. spending hours and hours in the light lab with different sources, with different fixtures, at different intensity levels, with different fabrics and and um, and models, people. Um, and just living with it. And, and that's how uh, I think 
uh, a lot of us have, right? Either solitary space in a lab setting or on production, you know, like spending that bit of time after focus is done and sort of like exercising your rig a little and feeling what it can do, which, you know, I think is a, a pretty universal experience. Um, you know, I, I think that those are what informed us and got us to that intuitive state um, with filters. And and I think you're right, Wendy. I, I think that um, through time we will we will get that. And I, I think that the benefits are are real in in the things that it brings to the art, right? And you know, I I'm reminded of the with great power comes great responsibility, right? We have all these new yeah. interesting things that we can do that assist the process. Now that LEDs are are getting uh, pretty equivalent in uh, brightness and spectral content as incandescent sources. Um, you know, we, we need to, a lot of us will be spending time, uh, sharpening those skills to make it feel as, as, uh, I call it lizard brain, right? The, the lizard brain, lizard part of your brain that just like doesn't react and you don't have to think about something. Um, I, I think we'll get there, but it's, it's time, it's usage, it's, um, repetitiveness, right? Using this, this thing in the, in different locations, in different, uh, atmospheres. Yeah. I, guess. I, have, I have a question for you too. Mm -hmm. um, as as Nick is talking about his light lab experience, um, do, how do you feel about halogen versus LED? For example, um, I, I'm sort of thinking about you know we we learned hand drafting, uh, although computer drafting was coming up, and then there reached a point where I was teaching, um, and the students, and I wasn't teaching the drafting part, but um, but there was a question of whether hand drafting should still be taught once computer drafting became ubiquitous, right? Um, and, and of course, we all said, well, what happens when your computer breaks, you know? <laughs> but, um, but I wonder, like, now, how do you feel about learning color if you're a light lab that only can have five fixtures? Is one of them a halogen with uh, you know, sort of legacy or historical reference gel file behind, or or no. Hello, rabbit hole. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I mean, I wonder, boy, if anybody's yeah. listening. In I think I actually have a series. shorter answer, so I just want to get okay. mine in, so that Declan can then like bring along <laughs> for as long as he wants. Um, I, I absolutely think so because I think uh, historical context. Wait, you think so? Which one? I think we should include it yeah. as a portion of that education it, for the same way that I feel like I don't think you should start anymore on hand drafting. Um, I think that that uh, and, and again, these opinions are, are solely mine and not reflective yeah, exactly. of anyone else. But like, you know, I, I, I also grew up learning hand drafting um, and it was uh, important for me to understand why the tools came to be the way they are in CAD because at CAD's inception, and now throughout it, um, there are tools and there are things that are done um, that facilitated or, or were aimed to get people who understood hand drafting into that space. You know, all of our save icons are still disks, right? So these these sort of things of like understanding why the technology is where it is is often reflective of where we came from in that area. And so I think for that purpose. Um, you know, series one, series two, series three, ETC LEDs were specifically our target was an incandescent HPL, right? That that was the like good enough bench. It, is this thing a tool that people will use? How close is it to a source for with an HPL? Um, so knowing why these tools came to be the way that they are, I think is really important. And uh, again, I I personally, you know. The Nick Gonsman Light Lab coming to a city near you. Um, I, I think that uh, starting out with the modern technology, uh, how to control it, how to think about it, will take students into that. Like it is starting to become lizard brain. You know, they can start to work natively in that space and that language. But understanding second semester, third semester, where all of this comes from, um, I think is really important. So that's my, and I would say going all the way back to, let's stick some colored wall, water in front of a candle and see what happens. You know, that's part of our history too, right? Like, so 
uh, the, the more you understand about uh, what the decisions were behind where we're at, I, I think that that contextualizes why the tools are the way they are. I mean, I, I think that, you know, there's, there's, there's no such thing as an original idea, right? I mean, as, as artists and creative people, all we do is steal other people's ideas mold them put them in our own voice and present them as our own i mean that and that's that's how stuff evolves and it's not you know not not to be you know not plagiarism or anything like that but that's that's you you see something you go oh that's nice if i put it there oh i found a thing and you know and and that's how it goes we, we all sort of steal from each other and i think the thing about being an artist or be a creative person or a program doesn't matter a programmer designer doesn't matter i think anyone in, in the lighting world is we have an innate sense of curiosity you know w what happens if i put that filter in that light or what happens if i just dial out the deep red or increase the light there's an inherent sense of curiosity i think that that makes us do what we want to do and that curiosity for me is also historic i i want to know what it was like to light a show with a pattern 23 okay i, I do i used to that when i started, I was the lighting shows pattern 23 so i've dated myself but yeah, I, I've never lit anything with candle or, or naked flame. I'd love to know what that is like. I have, a, you know, I want to see what's that quality. How does it flicker? How does it dance? So, yeah, I'll go and I'll sit in the dark room and I'll light five candles and, you know, I'll sit there for half an hour and, you know, see what it does and see how it interacts. And, and I think that's so important for anyone's development. Yes, absolutely. Embrace the technology, run with it, find new languages, help us to make it better and, and evolve but understand where it's come from. We chatted earlier about, about, about the, the, the dynamic range of a filter just as it dims, the sort of amber shift or uh, amber drift or red shift, or whatever you want to call it. There's a generation of designers out there now who have not natively experienced that. They have to go looking for that. And, and it's divided into two separate parameters now. <laughs> and, right? There's the red the shift, there's the color shift. And there's also the sort of the cadence of the decay yeah. as and to there's a timing aspect and a color aspect that are not inextricably linked. And, and it, it worries me that we are losing or are potentially going to lose this fabulous light source, which was tungsten or is tungsten hasn't gone yet. We're hanging on. We're hanging on <laughs> um, because of that, of what it can teach us as artists about how to light and how yeah. color works and how things fade and that that beautiful you know the fact that and, and again it was a happy accident when they invented the tungsten lamp they didn't intend it to start glowing from the center and grow out but it means you can just at 10 percent pick out someone's face and then we see the rest of them and we can't do that with led natively because it, it behaves different it's a flatter field and the other yeah. and getting into all that stuff but understanding where that comes from I think yes. it's so important because I think, you know, and same with learning console. Someone says, oh, I just want to learn EOS. And I'm going, that's great. There's a 10 fader, 12, three way preset console over there. Let's do a crossfade okay. there. And then let's come on to EOS because, you know, little yeah. fields get that sense of timing, get that sense of, of, of what that curve does as, as you fade and all that sort of stuff is that's in, becomes inherently part of our storytelling. And, and it, it you know, yes, we're all going to tell different stories. Story, the way we tell stories changes. I accept that, and there's new voices. And yeah, yeah. But I, but you know, we still study Shakespeare at school, and I, I think it's it's the same. It's the same thing. We should still be studying exactly what you said from yeah. where we've come from. And you know, light a candle, put a tungsten on a dimmer, and you know, wind it up and down a few times, and watch that beautiful warmth that comes out. That lovely. Deep yeah. red, dare I say it, that comes out. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> get that in there. Um, you know, but it's it's that's the stuff. You know, people go, why why have you got deep red? Well, that's why. Mm. Sit in a room, light a candle, mm. dim that fixture down to fifteen percent, and look at what it. That's why it's there. It's uh, yeah, uh, that rabbit hole. I, I could be, I could be lost. I, know, right? I could be Thank lost you. in the burrows here. Fantastic question. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. You almost got me going again on like move fade <laughs> instruction and stuff. So we won't even start any of that, you know. Yeah. But it is. It's it's those things. Once you understand them fully, they're out of your way, you know. And that's from teaching console classes to to sort of parallel it a bit. Um, 
understanding why move fade came to be and how how you know original computerized lighting systems were there to mimic the work of of the day is why tracking is the way that it is and once you don't have to think about that anymore as an active you know why are things changing as i go through my q stack um your headspace is freed up to manage other things and i you know exactly right like oh i don't have to think about what deep red is or what redshift is or if i want that tool i understand what it does and why it's there click it's on moving on with my life um so i think we're i think we're all in agreement it's fun and new <laughs> job done <laughs> So, do you think, oh, Nick? I suppose this is this is for you. It was as how how much more complicated is it every time a technology shifts? You've obviously got to be able to control that, but you also have to be able to control the historical stuff. I and mean, we still, you know, the the additive mixing is now a thing; it's everywhere. But so is subtractive mixing. We still have, you know fixtures on every rig that's going to be you know cmy and and how like where, where do we how do we how do we manage this because it's you know if i say you know take put a you know cyan at 25 percent is that the yeah. same as green at 25 and blue at 25 should it be <laughs> yeah, i don't I, know I, you know it's yeah, I, well, and so um, this is a consistent challenge from from the control side. Um, you know, the communication with the fixture um, right now is really kind of still dumb. Um, generally, we're belching out levels to a fixture that um, you know if we've if we've done our homework well enough, uh, we know a whole lot of the characteristics of those individual control channels. And the the console can make decisions before it sends out those levels, um, but but even with RDM, uh, at no point is the fixture really reporting any of those complexities to us. We know red is on this channel. Um, it does red uh, fade linearly across that zero to two fifty five range? Almost always no. Um, uh, you know, is, is red going to fade the same proportionally from? one brand of fixture to the next, even within the same manufacturer? Uh, certainly no. Um, so we are sort of in this constant pursuit of, um, and, and we work with a, a partner company uh, that works with us for our libraries. Um, between us and them, we work really hard to try and qualify fixtures, right? To say, okay, here's this, this DMX table, this, this data footprint. Here's what lives on all of it. And that's sort of the basics, right? That's what from intelligent fixtures, you know, if you actually think about a, a dimmer rack, right? As as long as control has been happening, uh, any sort of a digital or electrical control, um, you know, a, a DMX rack is uh, a 96 footprint uh, piece of equipment, right? We use 96 channels to control dimmer, 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 dimmer. Um, as we moved into uh, intelligent fixtures, um, much to the pain of, of many people, um, we translated that exact idea and we said, okay, this dimmer is now called pan and this dimmer is now called tilt. And, and you know, you have a choice from zero to hundred and that's sort of it. Um, we, we got into more intelligent fixtures. Uh, so we got into more intelligent control, uh, the rock and roll world, like really developed that stuff. Um, but uh sort of subtlety of color i feel like is something that again as, as wendy said like you know we we would just sort of mix stuff and hope for the best um but our color systems our, our remote control color systems were still a little crude right um uh when we got into led world out of the cmy world um that started to get more and more refined um and and precise color replication became really important um so we uh the best color control comes out of a qualified fixture a fixture in which we know um not just what channel is controlling which parameter um out of the dmx stream um 
but when you look at sort of a color engine as a as a whole entity, um, does EOS know what those colors are? Right. So uh, lime was new when when we came out with series two. Um, what what was lime? EOS had to be taught what lime was um, in order to understand how it worked with the other emitters to create uh, light. Um, uh, going back to the red, we need to know what red. Um, so Luster's red is very different than, uh, you know, Martin's red or or another fixture manufacturer is doing additive stuff. Um, so if we know those things, we can actually start to see uh, really predictable color control, right? And again, you're always going to be limited by the what the engine is capable of. Um, but for those color systems where we know uh, a lot of information about those individual parameters, um, we can really predictably output data to them, um, even though they're not feeding us that information back. I dream of a day in in the year 3000 where, you know, the industry is at a place where we hook up a fixture and the fixture self reports all that stuff. Um, it feels to me right now very um, cart before the horse where the manufacturer makes this light, they know everything about it, they send it out to the world, we grab it, we test it, we put our the best information that we have at the time back into the console, um, and then we jam out information to a fixture having no knowledge between the two. Um, so it's very crude right now, I guess is a long way to put it. Um, uh, but it's our current mechanism, it's the current system um, by which our data infrastructures allow us to, you know, the limitations of those data infrastructures. Um, so I think that there's been some improvement in the way, and if I'm ranting, you can cut me off too. Um, there's been some improvement in the way of um, uh, what we call sort of calibrated fixtures. So we can take fixtures, um, test them, and put that into the fixture profile, and then control them. Um, but a lot of fixtures now are, are doing their own math. Um, so instead of sending a fixture, red is at this level, green is at this level, blue is at this level, and not necessarily knowing what the cumulative effect of that is on the actual output. Um, you know, there are times when we can send huge saturation information down the DMX line, and the fixture inside of it has its own color space and math, and it knows the composition of its emitters, uh, and then it can predictably output color. So things like sending CIE information um, down the DMX line is something that we're seeing more and more adoption of particularly in film and television. Um, so I, I think those shifts are starting to happen. Um, but I guess, you know, we get into situations where you're sitting behind an EOS console uh, and and you're not getting the results you want um, where you're picking a gel or you're going in the color picker. And that always, almost always, has to do with the fact where we probably don't have enough information about that color system. Um, that's I I would ninety nine percent of the time that's the barrier. It's like we don't know enough about what that light expects to hear to get to the color you want. I mean that that raises an interesting point on the flip side of that is how many colors do we actually need? Because I mean I remember and again I've done nothing but date myself in this whole session. So here we go once more. I remember when high end systems launched the studio color. And I remember their marketing campaign, it was 16.7 million colors. And that's just maths, right? You take CMY, 256 steps, cubed, 16.7 yep. million. Okay. We, and absolutely, yes, technically, each increment is a new color. And, you know, if we add a you 16-bit know, color into that, we could quadruple that number or whatever the maths works out to. Um, but we're just not capable of seeing that many different colors, certainly sequentially at any rate. Um, you know, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. We, we do, you know, we do all this clever stuff in the background, but actually I just want blue. I just want purple. I just want red, you know, and it's, and it's, it's, it's hard because we have to have this infrastructure backing everything up, knowing that actually we just want red. We just want purple. We just want a nice orange. Well, and it, this is again where I advocate for for prep, right? Um, and and yeah. we talked about this in in our prep for this, but um, you know, I sort of always 
look at this as um, the decision has to eventually be made. And, and we've talked about this in this session, which is that like, okay, you're taking this, the time that you would spend choosing color and putting color in the fixture during focus and like all of that. And now you're trying to squash that into your, your tech process. Um, so, uh, and we, we had specifically with uh, the luster series of fixtures, um, you know, we had people starting to run out of tech time because that was the like, oh, I'll, I'll do it later. Um, so I, I actually think that like going back to a little bit of what Lee was talking about and like creating these color palettes, bringing in these suitcase things um, and having your 50 colors, 100 colors that you know that are comfortable for you, that you've gotten to through your experiences um, is going to be key. And then knowing that you can tweak because you're you're absolutely right. Um, you know, now take, I, I refuse to do this math, but eight colors, you know, uh, 255 to the power of eight, right? Like, uh, it just, right. Technically those are all different colors. Um, but what can we perceive? And, and so I, I think it will be, uh, in the same way that designers have always had their go-to colors. Um, I know what this thing does for me, so I'm going to put it in the show. Um, We'll get to situations where that thing, will, instead of traveling as a as a number um, and being bought for the designer and put into their lights, will be a, a color palette on a stick that says, "This is my um, sparkly blue," and and I'd like you to use it. Oh, we're in the middle of something, and it's that one costume is dying under this color. Cool, we can do some tweaky bits in the middle to preserve the character but adjust the light. I think that's where we're all shifting is. Um, trying to make a decision of one color between 255 to the power of eight isn't going to happen. Bringing things with you that you've prepped ahead of time that you know work in situations um, is so. So just take us on a, on a slightly different tack because we haven't really touched on it yet, but I, I, it's it's kind of a big thing is color temperature. I mean, we sort of touched on it. We've sort of mentioned, you know, sort of dimming dimming fixtures and daylight and stuff like that, but how, how does that, how, how, how do we think people are dealing with that in the world? Because I would, you know, you, you would choose as an LD, you, your figure your movers were generally up in the sort of daylight range and then you had your tungstens and, and you kind of sort of knew where that were, whereas LEDs don't really, you know, we could debate this, but they don't really have a color temperature in this. I mean, you know what I mean? I, I mean you know, Gray area. Uh, how? I mean, what, tips, thoughts. How? What, what's? What? Any approaches to sort of tackling this issue? I think um, I'll jump in first on this one. Um, I think to your sort of, they're not really designed to a thing. I think any any array that is intended to be able to produce white light, um, certainly at ETC probably at other companies too, there is an idea of what range of color temperatures you want to be optimized for, right? Is this fixture typically gonna be used in a theatrical environment? Then you wanna make sure your warmer color temperatures are beautiful. Is it typically gonna be used in um, the studio market or um, you know, a retail? Then you might care more about the higher color temperatures. Um, a lot of places now, because LEDs are not warm or cool, you can choose a sweet spot in the middle. A lot of places are choosing to be in that mid 4000 range. Um, and that, you know, being in there, it, it allows you to play nice with warmer things. It allows you to play nice with cooler things. Um, if you're in any kind of a situation where there are screens as part of the set, uh, you know, a display is usually natively going to be something like 6500k um so if you are trying to white balance the whole composition and the lights that are on the the faces of the anchors for example is you know 3500 either they're going to look like mud or the displays behind them are going to look off um and and what so the solution for many uh is if you can get the light on the performers up in the higher 4000s, you preserve some of the warmth and richness that you're sort of, that you want, um, while still keeping the color fidelity 
enough in the screens in the background. Um, I think now, obviously, higher end fixtures, you have the spectral content, you can have the light on the anchors be equally cool. Maybe you don't want it at 6,500, maybe 5,500, um, but you can still keep the warmth in the skin tones. Those sorts of things become an option. Um, I do, there, there are a lot of color tunable uh, or of, of white tunable fixtures on the market that have, um, and I, we even have some, <laughs> that are a warm chip, a warm white and a cool white, right? And you sort of, you know, so the warm white defines the low end of the capabilities and the cool white defines the high end of the capabilities. And you can vary the intensity of those two components and go on a straight line in between. So in this configuration, um, by definition, you cannot follow the black body curve all the way across um, because it is a straight line. So at some point, you're gonna, I suppose if both of the chips are well above, then you can, then you'll stay fully above and maybe you'll touch the black body somewhere in the middle. Um, but if both, you know, if your warm white and your cool white are both on the black body, then when you're mixing in between, you're going to be down below it, which is going to appear sort of pinkish, um, which is maybe fine, but it's very important to be aware that it is. Right? Like you can't follow that curve with a two color fixture. You will go on a straight line. Um, uh, this is if this is if the people who are listening don't really understand what I'm talking about here. There's a blog post um, blog.etcconnect.com. There's a, a blog post I wrote on a couple of them actually on on color temperature um, and on something called DUV, which is the distance, the deviation sort of, you know, above or below the black body, how far off you are, which might which will dictate how um, greenish or pinkish something might appear. Um, Everything is relative. So if everything in your palette is pinkish, then you can white balance for that and it'll all go neutral again, um, for example. But I think I think people are handling color temperature in a couple of different ways. One, warm and cool emitter, straight line between, you will not hug the black body and maybe that's okay. Um, then there are, there are certainly RGBs where supposedly you can mix to all of the points your ambers are really going to suffer. Those warm whites are not going to be attractive. You are not going to want to have that. Just, just, just look at it if you haven't. Mix all each of those incremental 16 million steps that are over at that end of the black body. Mix them and stand in them. And every skin tone will either be too red or too green. It will not render properly. So just please don't do that, <laughs> except as an exercise. <laughs> Um, RGBAs, the amber emitter is usually a pretty slopey wide, you know, it, it, it can be a direct emitter, very narrow band, um, in which case it can help but not completely solve that issue. Um, it, it can also be, if it's a PC amber, um, a phosphor converted amber, it could be very wide and slopey, um, much like our lime. Those broad emitters really will help open up the bottom end of the warmer color temperatures quite a bit in making them attractive. Um, as you get to the daylight, if you have a blue down in the corner and the green, you're, you know, you, you do sort of lose, you lose a lot if you don't have a cyan, um, in the rendering, in terms of the rendering, you really, you really do. So I just got way off topic, didn't I? Um, <laughs> I, I suppose it's important to understand for yourself with whatever equipment you're using, what you're doing. Are you trying to hug the black body? Do you care about just the chromaticity or the color point, or do you care how you get there? Because with very few emitters and giant gaps in the spectrum, you can hug the black body. That is different than emulating the spectrum that you would get with an actual black body radiator. Um, and the same if you if you if you leave the black body at the point um, where color science would, where the standards would suggest you do, um, TM30, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention TM30. Uh, if you aren't familiar with it, please look it up. Um, TM30, IES standard for um, characterizing color rendition capabilities of a light source. It is intended to replace CRI. CRI is, we should not be using CRI anymore. 
um, TM30 is, is intended to fill that need. The calculator for that leaves the black body at um, 4,000 Kelvin and does a blend between 4,000 and 5,000 uh, of black body spectrum and D50, which is another CIE standardized white. Um, and so, so it arrives at the daylight off the black body mark by that point. Um, and then you continue on, there's a D65. These daylight color temperatures are above the black body. So, so you may want to be following that. If you're trying to sort of work with a legacy HMI reference, then you probably want to do that. If you're trying to balance with the sun, if you're on the black body at 6,500, you're going to be a little bit down. Um, that's a, there you go. I'm going to stop because it's really enough school. I don't think we're meant to be in school here. No, it's all good. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, this, this is the stuff that, that, that we need to know because it's, it's not, you know, it's, it, it's important and it, it, it helps make informed decisions when, you know, when you're sitting behind the console, you're sitting in tech and you want to know why that, you know, 201 yeah. to go back to the swatch book again, it, you know, yeah. is not what you're expecting to see. It's, it's that, you know, it's, it, it's all of that science. And, and, you know, in architecture, this is actually a moment. I don't know if any of our listeners to this, to this, um, podcast webinar, I don't know what we're calling this, um, are in the architectural market. If you're mixing white sources, if everything, you know, the 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 box, the the quadrangle that that encompasses anything that can be marketed as a certain color temperature, is huge. And if you just, if you are only looking at that, if you are only worried about specifying fixtures that are 5600K for your office building lobby, they could be wildly different colors, wildly different. Um, and that's that's really important. DUV is a, is a measure that you can use to sort of to help um, TM30. The reports will tell you exactly what CCT um, because if it just says 3500, that's a marketing range. That is not the actual specific chip that you're going to get. And any product will have a tolerance. There'll be a range of of CCTs that you know if it's a 3500K white. The actual range of products in that box might vary from, you know, 34 to 36, um, for example. Um, and I'm not, that's just, I'm like, that's just like, I'm pulling that out of, that's not related to any one specific product. Um, nobody write in the comments, is that ETC spec on the thing or is that who's, I don't know. I'm just making it up. There's a range. Um, ANSI, C78.377, dictate the range. Um, but, you know, if you combine all those, that they're not going to match. So back to the point of having to be a little bit more of engineers than we used to be, it's not so simple anymore. Um, but, ooh, this is a soapbox of mine. Uh, we hold LEDs. This is a tangent, but it's a soapbox. And we have like six minutes left, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it in here. Um, we hold LEDs, I think, to a higher standard than we ever held historical sources. Legacy sources have never been subject to the kind of, to this level of expectation. We expected HMIs to be a hodgepodge. You would get your rig of, you know, whatever, your 60 moving lights, right? Your 60 studio spots, not, you know, um, but they could be, insert any HMI fixture here. And the shop would send them to you. And depending on how many hours of usage that particular fixture had had or what batch that lamp was from or the, even the same manufacturer lamp, you know, all these things, what you ended up with, if everything was in open white, was, you know, pink, green, yellow, all over the map. And we accepted it. And we didn't like it and we grumbled about it and, ugh, here we go. And there, But there was a point in the tech process where you would then sort of balance them out or <laughs> like you sort of dealt with it and and worked around it because it just it just was and unless you had the budget to specify my rig shall have all new lamps from the same batch from the same manufacturer you know you didn't have that luxury of that consistency and and even ellipsoidals there were you know for a long time you would occasionally get i don't know if this happened in the uk very much but certainly in the states you'd get some that were just green because that there was a type of glass that lenses were made from for a while, it was green. 
And so we would all like in with whatever color filter went in, you would also put a, a you know, a minus green, you'd put in a pink <laughs> to balance it out. And, and in, in the architectural world, MR16s are notoriously awful. They're notoriously a par 38s, right? Anything with an aluminized reflector, but with any, you know, they were all over the map, pink, yellow, green, and trying to get those to have, you'd go through a whole case to find, you know, the half dozen that looked consistent on the perfectly white wall in the gallery where there's no room for this kind of stuff, right? Like, and you can't put a, you can't put a plastic color filter in there, it'll melt and you can't do that. So, so I would just want, like, I just, I want the bar to still be high because we can continue to engineer these things better and better and better and better. And we absolutely should. We, you know, Declan, you and I have had this conversation. This is part of my, you know, we, I am going to miss halogen. It is so beautiful. And I want us to keep holding the bar high so that we don't lose it. I don't want to have to give any of it up. I want to move forward, but I don't want that loss. I don't want to have people who have grown up and, and they never knew what it was. And so they, you know, they won't miss it. If they ever saw it, they won't miss it. But, ah, uh, but also, I would love a little kindness in the development process, a little understanding. Not, you know, like, I mean, there's a difference between junk product that, that isn't made better for the sake of it being inexpensive or, you know, whatever, like not paying attention, not caring. But, but there is also, this is such a young technology, trying to get these things tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter is a lot of work. And, 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 and it's not there yet, you know? <laughs> so I guess there's a level of setting expectations where I would like a little bit of, of kindness to remain while we hold, you know, just some perspective, right? Uh, just to keep in mind, it isn't that LEDs are worse. No, no, it's always been a thing. Uh, it's a place All for that, continuous improvement. To, to just end cap that, um, <laughs> You know, to to also understand when when you're going through this, and we've talked about gel a lot, um, that that LED sources aren't gel, and LED sources aren't the same uh, system to system, um, and oftentimes LEDs can't match even within the same fixture family. Um, so, you know, taking some time with your light to adjust it to what you need it to be. Yep. Cool. I think that's that's actually a really good sentiment um, to to end the session with is take the time and 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 learn the new tools and play with the new color and and don't be shy to experiment and and see what happens if you take that color and knock out some of the green or add a bit more red or yeah take take the time. I think that that's that's going to be my my new motto for a while when it comes to color is is take the time because we do we used to sit and we used to take the time when we had our swatch books and sitting in our studios and, and all of that and and i feel that's been lost a little bit um and we should get back to that because i think it's, and, and we'll important. we'll do this again in in 10 years declan we'll put it on the calendar the exact same date I'll, and we'll, i'll send the meeting request as soon as we're done <laughs> we'll see we'll see how ridiculous we all sound <laughs> um <laughs> But thank no, you very no, much. No. That's, that's, it's been a really good session. Thank you both, um, Wendy and Nick, for, for joining me in the Light Bite session, kicking off season two. Um, thank you very much for everyone who attended. Um, our next Light Bite session is 1st of October. It works out perfectly. The next, first Friday in October is the first. And uh, super excited. We have um, Kristen Oliver, who is the UK's leading DOP in stop motion animation. He's lit for Ardman. He lit Wesley Craven's um, Isle of Dogs. Uh, so we're super excited. We're going to be chatting to him. And even more exciting is it is our first session back with a live studio audience. We are back in the Playhouse in London. We will be streaming it. So, um, you know, we, we'll, keep, we'll keep the online thing going. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's exciting for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and we're super excited. Uh, but thank you all for joining us. Thanks for giving up your Fridays, as always. Spread the word, share the love. Um, you can find us on the website, etcconnect.com forward slash lightbites. Uh, Nick, Wendy, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate you giving up your morning.
Uh, and um, I'm going to end the recording now. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a good weekend.